Hi, I'm Jeff Allen, Tamron National Technical Representative. Welcome to the Exposure Triangle. I'm going to talk a little bit today about controlling your aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, and how to help you get the best results by doing this. We're going to start off right away with aperture. Aperture is also often referred to as the f-stop. Controlling your camera's aperture will allow you to control a couple of things. Depth of field, what's in focus in front and behind what you focused on, and it's going to help you control uh, uh, shutter speed or being able to isolate a subject. Now it's a little counterintuitive. The small apertures uh, are the big numbers. Those are the large depth of field, but they also need longer shutter speeds or higher ISOs. We'll cover all this in a minute. The small numbers are the large apertures. They let the large volume of light through to the camera sensor. They also help you isolate the subject. So if you're shooting like at f4 or 2.8 or even 1.4 if your lens goes that wide, uh, you're going to be able to just focus on a subject and uh, anything in the foreground or background is going to be soft. So if you want to uh, specifically uh, isolate a subject, that's how you're going to do it. As you begin to stop down, more and more comes into sharpness. Now, you do have to pay attention to what's going on in your foreground and your background. For instance, in this example with this beautiful blue flower, we wanted, uh, we wanted the flower to be the main uh, center of attention in the photo. But as we begin to stop down, as you can see, by the time we get to even 5.6, but especially 8 and f11 uh, and f22, the lawn furniture in the background becomes an annoyance. So in this case, we will want to use a large aperture just to isolate our subject. Here's kind of another example of stopping down and, and not changing focus point. As with this orchid, as we begin to stop down, um, more and more comes into focus. However, you'll notice that even at f22, because we were using a macro lens on a small subject and we are very, very close, the depth of field remains very shallow. Uh, if you were using a wide angle lens or you took a couple of steps back, you'd be able to gain more depth of field. So again, knowing how the tools work, how your lens works is going to give you more uh, ammunition for going out and getting the right photo. Uh, it's also a situation where with a macro lens where you're very close and in increasing magnification or with a telephoto lens where you're increasing distant magnification, uh, the depth of field does decrease. So review regularly in the field to make sure that you're including or excluding exactly what you want in your photos. Sometimes you need a large aperture simply to be able to shoot a large, a, a large uh, opening. Uh, to let a small volume of light in, in low light situations, such as this night sky photo, where uh, a, a fast lens of f4 or faster is going to be very beneficial for you for low light photography. Next, we'll jump to shutter speed. Now, shutter speed is that fraction of a second uh, where the shutter opens and closes. Uh, very high shutter speeds, small fractions of a second, like one one thousandth of a second, or if your camera goes higher, two thousandths, four thousandths, maybe eight thousandths of a second, are very high shutter speeds that allow you to just freeze things in motion. And as the shutter speed slows down, as you can see here from the graphic example, uh, motion blur can uh, can happen. Also, uh, camera shake can, can induce motion blur at slower shutter speeds. So make sure you're experimenting with your camera and your lens to make sure that you're getting the right shutter speed for your shooting situation. Starting points, of course, around uh, 60th of a second for stationary subjects, a little bit higher if you're using a longer telephoto lens. Maybe you can get away with a little bit lower if you're using a wide angle lens. Uh, and then as uh, subject motion increases, you definitely need to increase your shutter speed to be able to freeze the action in the way that you want to. And here's a great example. Uh, at a thousandth of a second, the water in this fountain, all the water droplets are frozen in motion. But even if we drop to just 125th of a second, still a very fast shutter speed, a small fraction of a second, uh, but you, you see there, motion blur. When we go to a 30th of a second, uh, it becomes a much more pronounced uh, blur. And then by the time we get to 1 8th of a second, it's, it's a flowing motion. 
So uh, you can use this to your advantage when you want to uh, show off the motion of slow moving uh, subjects uh, or, or situations like waterfalls or, uh, or those sorts of things where you want a long uh, exposure to blur the subject where you have a strong stationary background. Uh, waterfalls kind of uh, fall into that one eighth of a second down to around 15th of a one, uh, uh, or I should say 15 seconds, will give you the best results. Sometimes you need a high shutter speed uh, and a small aperture, but as the light levels begin to drop, you may need to turn your ISO up a bit too, as we had to in this situation. Uh, sometimes you want to intentionally use a slower shutter speed to pan with the subject and blur it. Uh, sometimes down to a 30th of a second for motion blur if you're panning with the subject. Here we used a hundredth of a second to catch the cyclist uh, hitting the bottom of a jump ramp. And as you can see, by panning with the subject and keeping it centered, you're firing in a continuous frame advance mode on your camera. Uh, you're going to get that motion blur in the background. So subject sharp, but the background blurs, it's a great way of expressing, expressing speed and motion. So moving on, we go to ISO. Now what is ISO? That is simply your camera's sensor's sensitivity to light. The lower the number, the less sensitive, but the better quality you're able to get. Uh, better sharpness, better color saturation, but uh, you're going to use longer shutter speeds uh, and larger apertures in some situations, depending upon your, uh, your subject matter. Uh, with a night sky like this, of course, a tripod, it took 30 seconds at a very high ISO of 3200. Here's some good starting points again for you. Uh, you want to use the lowest ISO possible. Uh, for the shooting situation. Now, if it's a bright sunny day, that 100, 200, maybe 400 ISO if you're shooting moving subjects will be great, but as light levels diminish or as your subject speed increases, you're going to need to go to higher and higher ISOs. Another trick that's, uh, that's uh, very handy with a lot of the newest cameras, you can set an auto ISO. So if I want to go to a manual exposure setting because I need to maintain a specific shutter speed and aperture as I did here with very rapidly changing light values at sunrise, I put the camera in auto ISO. Now here it shows 100 ISO. A few minutes later, it, uh, it uh, dropped uh, down lower, and a few minutes before this, it was at a higher ISO. But my shutter speed and aperture were right where I wanted them. Another thing you should do with ISO sensitivity in your camera is go out and experiment. Uh, shoot uh, the same scene at different ISO settings. Start at the very low ISO. In this case, in a night scene, of course, you'd need a tripod and use the self timer or, or a remote release on the camera. But ISO 200 up to 3200, um, ISO 200, very sharp, good color saturation, very little noise. At 3200, still very sharp, but we're starting to see a lot of noise. And then beyond 3200, with this particular camera, I probably wouldn't go beyond there. At 12,800, uh, still pretty sharp, but very noisy. And uh, again, probably if I could get away with the lower ISO, I would definitely do it. I probably wouldn't use that high an ISO with that particular camera. Also, remember in uh, stationary subjects like this, nothing is really moving the scene. A low ISO will work fantastically well. Uh, again, tripod and use the self timer or a release cable so that you don't get uh, uh, any vibration induced uh, through the camera. Sometimes you have no choice but to shoot at a high ISO. Uh, this, little, uh, this little fellow was skidding around on this tree stump. I had to go to, because we were in the deep shadow, even though it was bright daylight, deep in the shadow, so I had to go to ISO 1600, 250 of a second, f6.3, which is the widest aperture at this lens at 400 millimeters, but it gave me a nice sharp but somewhat noisy picture. Now you can fix some of that in post uh, with programs that can vignette the edges uh, and minimize some of the, the noise that you see, uh, <clears throat> or there are programs that minimize noise in post-processing. They sometimes minimize sharpness as well, so you want to be careful with those. When you're out shooting, of course, always remember to look for the good light and move left, move right, get a little higher, get a little lower. Don't always look at the world from your normal standing height and that'll help you find the better light too. Uh, 
Uh, so your homework, your take home is to practice, 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 and also follow the other videos in this series. We have individual videos on shutter speed, on ISO, uh, and on aperture, so you can learn a little more in detail about what those will actually do for you. So thanks for following and joining me today. I'm Tamron Tech Jeff, and again, thanks for watching.